Well, if you would, grab your Bibles and open up to the book of Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at three verses this morning. And I have got a brand new Bible um, given to me by my wife. Um, so I'm going to be using it. Is that okay with you to use the Bible in church? Okay, good. Some church? No, I'm just teasing. Um, yeah, this morning I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. And we're in kind of the, the second part of just a simple but two-part series that we've entitled New Seasons in Ministry. And last Sunday, Pastor John shared about his journey over the last five years to really position and platform our church for kind of like her next best season possible. And, and today is kind of a marker in that journey of sorts. Um, today is a time of affirmation. Affirmation of a new season where, where Pastor John, I call him dad. You can't call him that. You could call him Street Fighter. That was a nickname at one time if you want to. But um, where he's going to just really be enjoying a role that he's always had, founding pastor. Um, he'll, he'll be enjoying that role to its fullest degree um, as long as the Lord sees fit. And then I'm just going to step into that role that he's been in um, since this place began in uh, 83 as um, just serving in that lead role. And w w the reason we're doing this, let me just share this before we get into the scripture, is real simple. The um, reason we're doing this is because we feel like God told us to do this. And he didn't tell it to us yesterday. <laughs> he, he told it like many years ago. And we wanted to kind of process that and pray through that and hear from good godly advice and counsel and those kinds of things. But we really do believe and we've come to a place of affirmation in the sense that we believe that this dynamic, this new season, is the best way we know how to serve you. It's the best way we know how in this moment and at this time to, to see the vision and the mission of our church be served optimally. Yeah, I think that's a word. Um, to just to see it served well. This vision, it's this vision that you know of, right? We'll put it up on the screen. To see new life in Jesus. That is, whether they know it or not, every single Christian church's vision. A church is not a country club for Christians. It's a platform through which the gospel goes forth in a community so people can experience new life. And once a church wakes up to her design, then God starts to use it. New Life in Christ has always been the vision since 1983. It was the original name, New Life Christian Fellowship. Still the vision. And the mission. Well, how do we do that? You're doing it right now. You know what you're doing? You're gathering together to love and worship God. That's what Sunday mornings are all about. You're learning God's word. You're singing his praises. You'll be taking communion. Some of you guys are serving in the different teams that happen here on Sunday mornings. You're giving. You're gonna, it's, this is how we love. Intentionally. There's a strategic way to actually love the Lord. It's called obedience. Those are things he called you to do. So we do that. We really feel like this new season will better platform and position our church as we have a founding pastor and a lead pastor serve collaboratively together in that way so that the community that is known as the church of Coastline Gulf Breeze can love God to a better degree. So they can connect together in real community and so they can begin to live on purpose, live on mission. You know, everybody ends up somewhere in life, but very few people end up somewhere on purpose. And I think there's a way to do that. I think there's a way to do that. I'll give you a little bit of insight into what I, I think about that. The NIV, Neil's interesting version. I was given a name. Anyone else in that boat when you were born? Okay, we're all liking that. When I was given a name, I was also given a scripture. My brother, my sister, and I were all given plaques that look like this. I'm the only one that really loved my parents. I still have mine. They lost theirs. No, I just teased. I don't know what happened to theirs. It's not my job to take care of them. I got to take care of me. Um, no, they probably still have it. I was just doing the brother thing. But the name that I was given is Neil Stephen Spencer. The verse that I was given is, is, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So this morning, 
We're going to look at that verse, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, but we're going to look at it a little bit in context, verses 12, 13, and 14 in just a moment. But the way you live on purpose, I think, is the way I think you live up to who you're, you're called, who you're named. What do you mean by that? We've all been given a name. Here's my name, Neil Stephen Spencer. Neil comes from the Irish Gaelic language, but if you look at the etymology of the name, it literally means, like it says right here, champion. Now, if you know me, that's not me. This guy's like, yeah, you're a champion. Well, I mean, I tell my kids that whenever we're doing board games. I'm the champion. You can't beat me. But, you know, really, I think the design of my DNA is to champion the name of Jesus, to be that one who's pointing to Jesus, to, to champion not a cause but a person. Stephen, it's interesting if you look up that name. I didn't, I didn't give myself this name. This is what that name means. Crowned famous, the prince. Like Now, here you go. If you look at it through the spiritual lens, who's Stephen? Stephen's the first martyr of the church. I think it's very important as a believer that you die to self and live your life not for yourself, but for Jesus and his people. Did you know that the name Spencer means administrator? <laughs> it means dispenser of someone else's goods. It means steward. So this is who I think I am. I think. I think I'm Neil Stephen Spencer. I think I'm called to champion the name of Jesus by giving my life to stewarding and dispensing that which is not mine. That's what I'm called to do. And so you know how so many people struggle to find out, well, who am I? And what am I going to? And they go to, you know, all these dynamics to figure that stuff out. I don't know. I'm just saying how it worked out for me. I just looked at what the name was that I was given. And I thought that God was sovereign in some sense that he, you know, he's a little bit in control and the name that I am given describes what I am to do. Now, don't take that too far. Don't get weird with that stuff. But I'm just saying, at least in my experience, I go, wow, that, that's, that's who I am. That's what I'm supposed to do. And so this morning, as we kind of finish up this little mini-series called New Seasons, I'd like to do four things together. You say, oh, my goodness, four whole things? We will get out of here before three. Do not worry. <laughs> But four things. We need to spend time in the scripture. I want to look at Philippians chapter 3, but not in a, in a way that's really an exegetical exegesis of the scripture. But I just want to share four practical points. Like, hey, from these three verses, hey, here's four things that God's word says and how it applies to us. Secondarily, I'd like to just share my story in four scenes, chapters, acts, whatever you want to call them. And then we're going to have a brief time of prayer, take communion, and we'll get you out of here so you can go to Walmart before everyone else gets there, right? I don't, are they open? Nobody knows. Nobody cares. Okay. <laughs> so those are the four things I hope to do this morning. Um, why don't we take our Bibles and look at Philippians chapter 3, and we'll tackle this first goal this morning, and that's to get into God's Word. Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 12, this is what Paul writes. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, one thing, one thing, forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race, and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Lord, very simply, very humbly this morning, we ask that by your Spirit you'd speak to us through your word. Thank you that we can pray that in the name that has conquered sin, death, depression, insecurity, and the grave. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth we pray. Amen. Paul is a guy who's very passionate. And when he met Jesus, all of his passion focused and centered upon declaring who Jesus is and what he's done. If you've ever read the writings of the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, you know that he really centers his time and attention and focus on major doctrinal truths. What are those? Justification. Well, what is that? That you can be forgiven. 
that you can be declared right in his sight because of the blood of Jesus. We'll celebrate that this morning through communion. A second truth that he just litters in every single letter he ever wrote was the process of sanctification. What is that? Being made free because of the way you live in Christ. Did you hear that? That there's an element of condition there. Absolutely. That you're in relationship with Christ. It's not a religious thing. It doesn't just happen by magic Bible dust. Like you partner with the Lord in your attitudes, actions, and choices and obedience. And as you become transformed by his spirit through your choices, even through what you're doing right now, tuning out or tuning in, you're making a choice. You grow. And God's desire for you is that you would change. Some of us don't like that. Some of us, when we find an element of comfort or resource or relationship, we want everything to stay the same. And we freak out when anything changes that. Because we don't 38 special life, right? We don't hold on loosely. And we're supposed to. It's the way of freedom as a believer. Every relationship, every resource, every experience, every possession, you, you spencer it, you steward it, you, you, you don't hold on to it. You let it go. And then you begin to grow. And that is the context of Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. The context is growing in your relationship with the Lord. It's not about justification in that section. It's about sanctification. And let me just share four, four simple little takeaways and life principles that are from these three verses. The first one, we're going to put it up on the screen. You are not made. You are being made. So what do you mean by that? Well, look again what Paul says there in Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse 12. He says, I've not achieved the things which I've already, these things or reached perfection. I, I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ first possessed me. He's saying this, listen, Jesus saved me to change me, to call me and form me and fashion me to be more like him. And I'm not there yet. I'm not made. I'm not done. I'm still being made. Remember the kids that asked that question, are we there yet? Listen, you're not there yet, right? George Mueller, if you don't know who that is, Google it. But this is what he said. Just as a little child is a perfect human being, but still is far from perfect in all his development as a man, so the true child of God is also perfect in all parts, although not yet perfect in all the stages of his development and faith. Did you get that confusion? That you're perfect in your position, but you are truly in your progression, progressing. Does that make sense? Positionally, yes, you're in Christ. You're made righteous. Practically, we're not yet made. We're being made. You're in process. That's called life, and it's filled with a lot of ifs. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, said, But while the work of Christ for us is perfect, and it were presumption to think of adding to it, the work of the Holy Spirit in us is not perfect. It is continually carried on from day to day, and we will need to be continued throughout the whole of our lives. Billy Graham, you may not need to Google that name, but this is what he said. Each life is made up of mistakes and learning, waiting and growing, practicing patience, and being persistent. A mentor of mine once told me this, Neil, it's not heaven until it's heaven. You're not going to be perfect. And guess what? Neither is your pastor. Neither is your spouse. Here's what happens to those that you may recognize the hand of God on their life. Oftentimes what happens is you deify them until you demonize them. You see something in their life that you go, wow, that's cool. That's good. I see God in that. There must be something about that vessel. Not really. The vessel is just the good stuff you see is Jesus. And there's this element where you go, man, they put that person on a pedestal. And then they realize, well, they're not made. They're still being made. That guy still goes 46 and a 45. Can you believe it? That guy stubbed his toe and said something he shouldn't have said or hit his elbow or whatever it is. Yeah, nobody's the deity other than Christ. 
So don't deify a celebrity or whoever or whatever the person is. Because ultimately what you do when you deify, you will eventually demonize. And so many people do that with pastors. We're not there until we're there. And there is heaven. Now this is a point that's true to my story that I want to share just briefly. But I need to share it. And I need to see your eyes. I need to know that you're engaging with this. Because this lesson took me a long time and wasted some of my years believing a lie. This is the lesson. Falling is not failure. Failure is not getting back up. Falling is to be human. This is what I mean by that. You are going to fall. Stumble trip, fall to your knees, get knocked down, or get tripped up relationally, financially, organizationally, maritally, in every single way of your life, body, soul, and spirit, right? Like some of us would go, oh man, I'm, I'm not falling, I'm filling, you know, like we're all going to have that. We're going to have dynamics in life where you are not made, you are being made, but listen to me. Let me have your attention, let me see your eyes. Falling is not failure. Failure is failing to get back up. The Bible says that a righteous man falls seven times. The implication is the dude just keeps getting back up. Be free from trying to live perfectly. The Bible's just talking about progression in your walk with the Lord, not perfection. We have a perfect one. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And the enemy will often bring condemnation when you fall. Say, look at what you did. You did it again. You can always discern condemnation and conviction. You need to be convicted. Very simply. Condemnation always brings doubt, fear, despair, frustration, imagination, speculation, and depression. If what you're thinking about what you've done leads you to those emotions, you can identify that's the enemy. I'm free from that. I don't have to listen to that. Conviction always points you to Jesus, what Jesus has done for you and how you're forgiven even though you fell. Listen to that. That's conviction. But this first point is ever so important. We are not made. We are being made. The second point is this. The less you do, the better you'll do it. Paul talks about like, doing this one thing, focusing on this one thing. And you may say, how in the world do you do that? Because my to-do list has a to-do list. Like, have you ever been a parent? Have you ever been a boss? Have you ever been just an employee? Have you ever been a, just a human? Like, there's a lot to do. you got to put deodorant on. you got to brush teeth, right? There's stuff to do. Here's the deal. This one thing mentality, you must look at it in this way. <sighs> to live in freedom and to live in simplicity, because complexity is a weakness more than it is a strength, and elimination is essential to concentration, here's the reality. This is about a lens on life, not a list that you put God at the top of. Most of us do this. Yes, I want to live for Jesus first, so he's at the top, and then i got all these other things i got, I got to figure out on my own. No, no, no. You've bought into this one thing mentality as a list. It's meant to be a lens. Say, what do you mean by that? Paul put it this way. No matter what you do, you eat or drink or you do this or that, do it all unto the glory of God. Have you ever heard of Brother Lawrence who wrote the book, Practicing the Presence of God? Brother Lawrence was a monk who lived hundreds of years ago. And you know what his job was? He wasn't the cool musician on stage. He wasn't the communicator from a stage. You know what he was? He was the pot washer. He was the guy in the kitchen. And his job description was clean the pots. And so here's what Brother Lawrence said. God's with me. I know he's with me. And I'm going to live my life in the reality of his presence. And do you know what broke out in that monastic community? Revival. Because an individual woke up to the reality that Whoa, I can live my life with this lens. One thing I do, I do everything unto you. God, you're not a part of my list. You are the list. Everything I do is worship. Worship is not this. Worship is that. 
It's what you do behind a screen. It's what you do with your money. It's what you do with your language when you're upset. It's how you treat your spouse. It's how you treat your employees. That's worship. And once you begin to practice the presence of God in the minutia of life, you begin to live. You begin to come alive. And here's what happens. Life is infectious. <laughs> life is attractive. Life is something that everybody wants. And so a revival breaks out from a pot washer because he realizes that the less that you do, the better you'll do it. The third point of application is this. Paul writes in verse 13, forget the past, look forward. Here's what we need to do. Honor the past, but live in the moment. See, here's the reality. What matters most is what's in front of you right now. Like the people that are most alive are the people that live where they live. Say, so what do you mean like that? You're not alive five minutes ago. You're not alive five minutes from now. You're alive right now. Live where you are. Be present. Focus. Honor the past. Like you know how the Bible talks about building monuments. Remember what God has done. But on the same dynamic, on the other side of that coin, there does need to be a little bit of like, but that was yesterday. God, I'm not going to put you in a box because of what you did in the past, you must do in my present or in my future. Another, another idiom, another phrase, another little thing that rolls around in my head that a mentor once said, he said, Neil, you must always think outside the box but inside the book. If you'll think that way, God will do much through your life. But so many people, they live in a box. No, it must be this way. It must be done this way. We've always done it this way. Tradition. Remember that movie? No? Nobody? Okay. It's a good movie. Fiddler on the Roof. Nobody? Man, you guys are not cultured. You guys got to get into that stuff. No, anyway. Honor the past, but live in the moment. That's what Paul says. I can actually look at the past and honor it, but I can also let it go. The freest place to be is to be in the moment. But it takes intentionality. It's not easy. But it's the most rewarding. Last point of application. The longer you've been at it, the more you'll need to work it. He says in verse 14, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. It's tempting to think that eventually you won't be tempted anymore, right? <laughs> that you'll reach that place where maybe you can kind of just relax and allow the momentum of your life just to kind of carry you. When Paul wrote this, he had been a Christian for three decades. Planted too many churches to name. Wrote most of the New Testament. And you know what he said? I'm still charging. I'm still going for it. I'm still getting at it. The longer you've been at it, the more you need to work it. I do believe that maybe some of us need to rethink success or what maturity really is. The Bible seems to indicate that maturity is something you're always pursuing but never reach. And as you get closer and closer to the finish line, you don't start to, to relax, you reload. And you keep pressing in, you keep pressing in, you keep pressing in until Jesus finally says, okay, you're done. Come on home. It's easy to get in a rut. So after a while, you kind of maybe, maybe for some of us, we need to do something to kind of shock those spiritual muscles, right? You know how that works physically or in diet? You keep doing the same thing over and over and it's kind of like, ah, it doesn't have the same impact. Maybe it's been a while since some of us have actually served Jesus in a sacrificial way. Maybe it's been a while since we've opened our mouths and showed and shared someone our story and how Jesus has saved our lives. Like sometimes you have to think outside the box, but always inside the book, the book that is the Bible. Now here's the deal. You might be thinking, man, he's already done with those four points. It's not even noon. If he's the new pastor, this is awesome. We're going to be out of here so soon. Like, this is great. Well, I'm sorry, but this is just point number one. Remember scripture? Now we're into point number two, the story. These four points, I think, are, are at least for me, like, these are phenomenal. Like, 
that I'm so thankful that I, I'm not made, but I'm being made. That's freeing for me. I, I'm, I'm so thankful that the less I do, the, the better I'll do what I'm doing, the, that I can honor the past, but I can live in the moment, and that I need to be reminded that the longer I do something, the more i got to keep doing it. And these truths, I've seen them come alive in my life. So let me just share a few scenes of my life, my story. I'll call this first scene early life, age 1 to 18. Family. I grew up in the Spencer, Schluter, Norton family. My dad, part of the Spencer, Schluter clan. Say that 15 times. Eight kids, kind of a part of that, 19 grandkids. This is an old picture of that crew. You can tell it's old because my dad is, well, because look at what we're wearing. But I mean, like, my dad has got my brother Ryan on his knee. He did that a couple days ago and it was awkward. We were going to, no, just kidding. Like, um, but I mean, like, that's, it was a long time ago. Um, some of these family members have gone home to be with Jesus. Some new family members have been added. But that's part of my story. Those humans right there. They're connected to me. And then my mom, she's from this family known as the Nortons. There were five kids four sisters and three of those sisters including my mom lived here and there's seven grandkids out of that dynamic and here's a picture of that crew this is actually taken over in the courtyard uh the man in the center there is richard norton my my grandfather and my mother's dad um so my brother and sister and i grew up as pks pastor's kids with about with about two dozen cousins in this little what is this like five six miles however big this area is like not that much space, a lot of humans that go, that are connected to us. And our family, to some people, not everybody, but to some people, have, they know a little bit about us through some surf shops called Interlight and through a church called Coastline. That's my background. That's who I am. And then I met Jesus. Around the age of seven or eight, I can remember living off Salon Drive in um, Tiger Point, had a salvation conversation with my mom. I can remember at the age of 15, being in Colorado Springs, my parents used to take us to Colorado Springs every summer for about three or four years to go to a, a Christian camp that was run by the Navigators. And I remember the first time I went at the age of 15, I met this guy named Corey. And I just thought Corey was, I guess that would have been the 90s, 80s, like 90s, not the 80s, so like too legit to quit. That's what I thought he was. Like, man, this guy's real. Like he loves Jesus, but he's also not like, Lame, like he's, he's a normal guy. I'd like to be like that. Like he loved jars of clay. Remember that song, Flood? Like that's the era. That's about what I, so at the age of 15, I become a chaplain in my high school, Aletheia, student government thing. I become a worship leader in my youth band. Um, I even worked here in the building and grounds department. If you know Brad Harrison, that dude was my boss. Neil, go do this. Neil, go do, okay, that's what I'll do. That's who I was. I can even remember Oma, my grandmother, asking me one time around this time, Neil, what do you want for your birthday? And I was like, I know what I want. I want a Bible book cover. Like, that's what I wanted as a 15, 16-year-old kid. And then came the teenage fog. I say, what is that? Well, this is what it was for me. Around the age of 17 and 18, I fell in love with love. But I thought, I thought... I fell in love with a person. But hindsight is clarity. Foresight is not. And sight in the moment rarely is. In hindsight, I go, oh, man, I was just kind of like in love with love. I like I liked the romantic stuff. That relationship distracted me. But I'm a bit of a romantic. I mean, even when I proposed to my wife, Cece, I also like to be frugal. Nothing wrong with that, right? So, like... I learned on February 15th, Valentine's stuff is cheaper that day than the day before. But I'm not, that, I'm not terribly cheap. I was in Haiti until February 14th, and my wife's birthday is February 15th. So I'll never forget being uh, 2007, February, um, CC. Uh, I was living in this little apartment above my grandmother's house for $100 a month. God bless Oma Schluter, such a sweet person. Um, and so I went to all these places like, man, you can get big old teddy bears for like pennies on a dollar. And so got home for Haiti and I went to all these places and bought flowers and rose. I look like I spent 2000 bucks. I spent like, well, I'm not gonna tell you how much I spent. That's not, it's none of your business. Um, but, um, but anyway, like I like that kind of stuff. I wrote a song while I was in Haiti and I shared that song. I had DVD, you know what a DVD is? Like I put these images on a DVD. I had it playing on the screen. Like I'm just that kind of guy. That's how I am. So anyway, that dynamic, when I was 17, 18, I, I was like, man, I like this stuff, but I learned, uh-oh, wrong person. Wrong person. See, when I was a teenager, 
Maybe I'm the only teenager like this. But as a teenager, I didn't have the resource of time and experience. I just turned 39 on Wednesday. So I've kind of lived the teenage life twice is the way I feel. And I I would say like I'm still learning a ton. But there's no substitute for time. And when you're a teenager, you're a, a, a teenager. You're still developing. You're still learning. You're still growing. You're, you're, you're still being made. God put parents and pastors and friends in your life for a purpose. And you can choose to, to talk to them and hear what they have to say, or you can choose to not. But I learned the hard way that authority is your friend, not your enemy. Mike Doyle was my youth pastor at that time, and I don't think he enjoyed that time. You know, while I was his, he said I was the worst kid he ever had in his youth group. Anyway, Mike, sorry about that. But um, second scene in my life, I call it the call to serve. After some falling, some falling down, I thought I had failed. I thought, like, well, my life's done. I screwed up. What am I going to do? I guess I'll go to California for a few months. My dad gave me this opportunity to go to Bible college, all expenses paid for four months where you live in this dorm with six other guys and your meals are done for you and you learn the Bible. And so here's what I thought. This is where I was. I'm going to be honest with you. I'd been distracted at that moment in my life. I thought I'll live in California for four months. I kind of like to network if you know me a little bit. I kind of have a lot of friends in different places. So I thought I'll make some relationships. I'll get a job out there. I'm never going back to Florida. That's what I thought. But what happened at 19 in Bible college is the word of God was taught and I got removed from my community. There were no Spencers. There were no Schluters. There were no Nortons around. There was one guy out there by that last name. Well, my uncle Yancey did come to Lowers one time and I spent a weekend with him there, but that's a digression. But like, I didn't know anybody. So I was like, well, this is kind of cool. People don't know who I am. This is no disrespect to family, but it's a little bit refreshing. Like, man, I, maybe I can figure out who I am out here. And the word of God kept being taught. <laughs> and the word of God is powerful. I had so much of it sewn into me because of navigators and Aletheia and my parents and youth pastors that when there was some removal of the community I was in because community shapes identity and community shapes choices, you do become who you're around. The word of God had a moment to breathe into my life. And I'll never forget, on a Sunday night with Brian Broderson teaching this chapel service, God very clearly said, Neil, make a decision. Either serve me or serve yourself, but you can't do both. And it just kind of put me on my heels a little bit. I was like, well, not to be so mean about it. I didn't say that, but I was like, it was very direct. And I was like, well, that's how I felt. I kind of already done the serve myself thing. I don't, I don't like it. I feel like I, um, I fell. So I'd like to get back up, but it took me some time. It took me a couple years to uh, figure out how to get back up. And God was gracious in that because I, I chose not to make many friends in Bible college. I thought, you know, friends, friends are great, but I need to learn. I need to train. I need to heal. And so I uh, got a job selling cell phones at a local mall um, and just listened to Chuck teach the Bible every night with this little MP3 player. I went through Genesis through Revelation with Chuck. And it was just kind of me and Chuck, not in person, but on MP3 in that little Temecula mall. And it was very formative for me. And, And I graduated from Bible college um, with a bachelor's in biblical studies. In fact, I have a little video with Chuck on there. Let me just show that to you real quick. It's like 40 seconds. Don't worry, you're not going to die. Hi, my name is Neil Spencer. I'm from Gulf Breeze, Florida. And tonight I just wanted to thank the staff of the Bible College just for investing their lives into raising up the next generation in the Word of God. In these past two years, I've been given a solid foundation in the Word of God and growing closer in our relationship with the Lord. Mom and Dad, I just want to let you guys know that I love you and appreciate all your support. And in First Timothy 6, we're told, But you, O man of God, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. 
So um, even then, I didn't have great hair, if you kind of saw that. But um, after Bible college, God opened a door with this guy named Ricky Ryan and this other guy named Britt Merrick to, to learn and train more in ministry in this little town of Santa Barbara. And so I lived and worked in Santa Barbara for a few years. And there I, I worked in children's ministry and youth ministry and mission trips. And I made what I would call life friends. It's a picture of two roommates that I had. We lived in this little, I think it was somewhere between five and 600 square foot I think you could call it a home. We didn't live on a street. It wasn't good enough. We lived on an alley. We lived on Curly Alley, right, right near State Street. So we lived in this little place, um, and it was a bunk bed with a trundle. So I got the trundle. So every day they would just jump on me. Hey, wake up, Neil. And so anyway, Nate and Jess, Nate's in the middle there. He pastors Anthem Chapel in Goleta, California, and Jess McKernan pastors Coastline Destin in Destin, Florida. And these two guys were very helpful and me learning how to get back on my feet. It took me a long time to get back up. Um, but then here's what happened. Santa Barbara wasn't home. There were no roots there, and I didn't have enough money to live there. So I came back. I came back to Gulf Breeze, started serving at Calvary Chapel around the age of 24, 25, uh, coffee house, bookstore, extension Bible college at that time. I moved here on a Wednesday. I met a girl named Cece on a Friday. And then I got invited by John Corson to come to this like three-month apprenticeship training school in Oregon. And I told him no. He was like, what? He, I got a girlfriend. I'm not, I'm not coming to see you. And my dad heard about it. And he said, Neil, John Corson. I was like, yeah, I know. But he's like, you need to think about that. So, okay, I'll think about that. So I thought about it. I said, you know, I probably should go to that. Probably would not be a good idea to turn John Corson down. Because what he wanted to do is he wanted to move us all to Oregon, these 12 guys, give us each our own log cabin. And it wasn't a suffering situation, I'm just going to be honest with you. We had our own little log cabin. We were kind of like in this resort with waterfalls, and it, it was like meticulously maintained like Disney World. It was so clean. I know this is bad, but they hired a chef, so they cooked our breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And this was our job. He said, guys, I want you here six days a week, six to eight hours a day, you cannot bring a computer. You cannot bring a phone. And I just want to share with you at the age of 50 what I wish in my 20s someone at the age of 50 would have shared with me when I was in ministry. So I want you to write this stuff down. So I bought some journals and I wrote all that stuff down. I still have them and I use them quite often. They're very helpful to me. But um, the, that's how I got to know Cece. You say, what do you mean? Well, we got to know each other through letter writing. Because we weren't allowed to phone call. There were no, we couldn't get on the internet. They wouldn't let us do that. But it is church, so I'll be honest. A few times I snuck away to a payphone and I made a little phone call to CC. I think John probably knew that. But um, yeah, that was a great season. And, and I'll just say a few more things and we're almost done. Um, before I left for that, I remember calling a friend named Britt. And Britt had started this church called Reality. This was about 2006, 2005, somewhere in there. I said, Britt, man, thank you for what you did in the college ministry. I was part of his college ministry, and um, our family's kind of connected through some different things with my cousin. I don't get into all that, but like, um, I said, man, I really like what you're doing with reality. You're kind of like the grandchild of Calvary Chapel. It's very similar, but it's got some unique dynamics to it. Can I be a part of that here? Like, could you do reality Pensacola, and I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll sweep the floor, but like, can we do that? He's like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, I think... There should be more of you. Like there's a lot more people than Carpinteria, California. And what you're doing resonates with me. It really helped me. Can we do that where I'm from? He said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, neither do I. But I'm about ready to move to Oregon. And when I get back, I'm going to give you a call and we'll talk about it. And while I was in Oregon, John was very helpful. John said, Neil, you're in Florida. Brit's in California. So yeah, well, we can kind of network. Can we bring it over here? He said, you know what, I think God will give you a third option. A third option. I was like, what does that mean? He said, mm, I don't know. But I think that God will birth something over the next 10 or 15 years. Um, and what that ended up being is a vision that I like to call coastline life. I'm not going to talk more about that next Sunday. But it's why Destin exists. It's why Navarre exists. I do think it's why Gulf Breeze exists. But I moved back to Gulf Breeze. 
married Cece on May 12, 2007, in this church, and this picture is over there somewhere. <sighs> Serve the Lord, youth ministry, worship, administration. 2010, we moved, or we got connected to Destin. There were these eight people live streaming what was going on here. And I went down on January 10th, 2010 with a guitar, a Bible, a wife, and a one-year-old. And I said, hey, we're here to help you. And six months later, that, that eight had turned into 80. And, um, it, you know, at its peak or whatever, it grew to about four to 500 people there in Destin. Um, that's if you count Easter Sunday. That's a day, right? You count that day. <laughs> um, but, you know, normally it was like two or 300 people. Not, that's basically what Destin was. Um, but in 2012, we officially moved there. And we helped plant a church by the name of Gathering Church in Fort Walton in 2013. Um, we assisted in the planting of Coastline Navarre in 2015 and another church called Redeemer 30A in 2015. So many wonderful outreaches and ministries there. I remember we brought Phil Wickham to do a concert outdoor at the Commons. This was before like the, a second edition was built. It was like wherever this fountain was. That's where the fountain is still. And Phil's like, I've never really done an outdoor mall. I said, well, you know. Think of it as an indoor mall without the roof. You know, like, just do it, man. And um, he was very gracious, and he did it, and it was awesome. And um, by God's grace, we also helped um, spearhead kind of the first, like, collaborative with 17 churches event that was all about gospel proclamation. We, we kind of streamed Greg Laurie's Harvest America at, um, what's that place called? The Harbor Walk, right there where the Emerald Grand is, and we brought this mu musician named Francesca, and she played, and lots of people came. Lots of people responded to the gospel. Um, the For King and Country Boys, they came one time and did a real, real helpful thing for orphans. We were able to raise a lot of money for them. And all I'm trying to say is Destin was a great season, like a lot of great ministries, a lot of great friends, a lot of wins, a lot of losses, a lot of learning, a lot of falling down, a lot of getting back up again. During that time, I graduated from Calvary Chapel University with a master's degree, and then in 2017, I was asked to move back to Gulf Breeze by my dad. And again, just like John Corson, I said, no, I'm not doing that. I like where I am. <laughs> and then I was in Haiti for a minute with my daughter, Lily, on this trip that we did. Uh, we took maybe like 30 people, 20, I don't know how many people we took from the church, but we were there. And I'm kind of an early riser, and it was early in the morning, working on some stuff. And the Lord said, Neil, why are you in Destin? So well, you put me here. That's what I'm doing. But I'm asking you to go home. I said, I don't, I don't, I, no, I don't think you are. <laughs> um, I think I am home. I am in Destin. And he said, look around you. And I looked around at the landscape of Haiti and the missionaries there. And I realized they weren't there because of the shopping or the beautiful landscape or just because they liked it. They were called there. And I love Destin. I love the people. One of my best friends pastors the church. But I have a lot of friends there, all down that 38 corridor and all over the place there. But that's not where I was called to serve. It's that same kind of dynamic at 19 at Bible College, where what the Lord had said is, Neil, you're going to serve me or serve yourself. And not that serving in Destin would have been serving myself completely, but I knew the Lord was calling us here. And so, since 2017, we started to make the preparations to transition that church well, not to do it haphazardly or fly by night. My wife and I moved here to uh, Gulf Breeze in June of 2019, and then we moved two more times after that to get the right home. So that was three moves in 10 months with five children, which I don't recommend. <laughs> um, and now we're settled. We feel like we're in a home that we really enjoy, and we like, we like you guys, and um, we love this church. And this is a picture of my family on Easter, COVID style. Took a picture. Of the, we got dressed up for Easter, even though we did it all online. My wife said, we bought outfits. We're taking a photo. So we went out there, and there's Lily, Lucy, and Layla, 11, 9, and 7, all homeschooled. Liam and Leo, just terrors, Liam and Leo. Um, yeah, and we're here, man. We're, we're so excited to be here. Um, we're honored to be here. We consider it a, a privilege, not a right, to serve you. You guys are a precious church. You may not know this, but you have a fantastic history with a strong foundation and a stellar 
reputation in the community. Those things are, are earned over time. They don't happen like, oh, we're starting a new church. Like that stuff, that's 30 years in the making, man. And so all we're doing now with this new season is we're just trying to do roots with relevancy. That's what we're trying to do at Coastline. And you can't buy that. You can't build that overnight. God has to build that over time. So I feel like the Lord has us, has us in a very unique season where the vision is so simple to see new life in Jesus. But I just want to do what, what I feel like Pastor Chuck trained me to do, what my dad's invested in me, what Britt and Ricky and this other guy named David, David and Mike Doyle and all these guys, man, just make the church the, the best loved and the best fed place. Like, take care of the people, love them, feed them God's word. Sometimes you have to speak into life, just like you do with other humans. Like, hey, that's not the right way to go. Being a pastor, I grew up with one. It's not an easy thing. Because you have to, like, speak into people's lives that are friends. And sometimes that costs you the relationship. But it's what you do. Because it's not about you. It's about serving God by serving his people. And so my wife and I, that's, I think that's what we want to do, right? Yeah, that's all we want to do. And so that we've done now. We've done scripture. We've done story. Those were the long parts. So you guys made it. You can breathe. And what we're going to do now at this moment is my mom and dad are going to come up. My wife is going to come up. My mom might preach a little. No, just teasing. Um, they're going to share. They're going to pray. Then we're going to take communion. And you guys are going to be able to go home. So uh, my mom and dad are going to share just a few moments. And then uh, we'll pray. And then we'll take communion together. All right. Um, first of all, I just want you to know that Lynn and I are very excited about this season. We're, we're not retiring, we're not leaving, we'll still be around, and I'll be still teaching quite often, so we're, we'll be here. It's a great privilege to have been able to um, plant the church and see it come to the stage it's at, but I think better years are ahead. Uh, we live in a crazy time. I think that uh, God's going to do some amazing things during this end times that we're living in. Amen. And, um, you know, it's exciting. You know, I don't think there's any greater thing for a parent to see his children grow up and serve the Lord. And so I've, I've had that privilege of both my sons and my daughter. And my daughter got a master's degree in theology from Liberty University. Growing up, we called her Bible Jenny. <laughs> and uh, she still holds Bible studies in her home. She's in the military world now. Her husband's a pilot, but I'm not going to say anything else about my kids. Um, this is an exciting time. Uh, as Neil mentioned, we, we grew up in this community. This is my hometown. I planted a church here. My, my brother Yancey was a pro surfer. There's a statue out on the beach of him. Some of you have seen an eight-foot bronze statue. So where the cross is out there, we're going to put an eight-foot bronze statue of Pastor John <laughs> with a Bible in my hand. No. God forbid. Let me just say something. Just, okay. Yeah, all I want to say is God has been so good. And God is faithful. And he's been so good to us. So we are, real. this is good to us and the Holy Spirit, what's going on here. It's bittersweet, but it's mostly sweet. And so we are so proud of our kids and proud of Neil and who the man he is today. And we give God all the glory for that. But I do believe in the power of a praying mom and the power of prayer. And I do remember uh, talking to my kids at night and saying, you know, praying for their spouses. You know, God has that. Well, I do believe in the one and only. I believe God has someone who one of our kids he's was making and cc is god's gift to neil to this church and i believe that uh he has just brought her alongside of him for such a time as this and you know she would laugh and tell me no i know why stuff never worked out i said yeah because i was praying for you <laughs> and you know so we, we love cc and neil and we're excited about this time but we did know early on with our kids and you've heard john talk about this not only does god have a plan but so does the enemy so the power of prayer, you know, in a life of a mom and a dad and a faithful God that hears and answers prayer. We give him all the glory. And what a privilege it's get to has, has been for John and I to get to do this. It's been an absolute joy. And we're not going anywhere. I said last week, John, after he started making his announcements that we were coming up on social media, John, they're going to be so disappointed when we 
chill it next week. We haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> so we're not going anywhere. We're here. Our hearts are here. John and I grew up in this is what we get to do in that family. So we get to come alongside. So we're done. We're not done, but we're done. Uh, I'm done, right? Done. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, 37 years of being the lead pastor, everything from gosh, starting in a school to building the first building. I can't even remember how many um, funerals I've, I've done, everything you can think of, every possible scenario, and um, counseling, all that kind of stuff. But it, it, it's, it's a spiritual battle, but it's a great, amazing privilege to invest in people's lives. And that's what it's all about, investing in people, telling them about Jesus, and getting to find your purpose. And um, we're, we're just grateful uh, for the church, for you guys, and for the fellowship we have in Christ. And uh, praying for Neil and Cece as we step into this new uh, season. And I shared last week that if you have any praise reports, you can bring them to me. If you have any complaints, complaints problems, <laughs> issues, here's your man. There's your man. <laughs> No, that's, that's a kid. That's a kid. Let's stand and let's pray. Then we'll take communion. Lord, thank you for leading and guiding by your spirit this church. Thank you for the part that Lynn and I have had to play in it. We know it's not about us. It's always been about you. And Lord, may it continue to be about you. May you always be the one who leads and guides and directs and gets all the glory. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being in the body of Christ. And we know and realize that it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So lead us, Lord, into this new season. And may you do things far beyond what we ever would expect or imagine, because you're so good. Bless our time now as we take communion. Lord, may you anoint Neil and Cece as they step into this role. And help us to be supportive. Help us to be alongside coaching as we can. And Lord, may Coastline Calvary Chapel be planted all along this coastline. And may you receive all the glory and praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.